Hey, Darren, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, man. I'm really pumped to be here. So I'm really excited to talk to you today because uh, I have used your product before. It's a really, really cool tool uh, that you guys have developed. And um, I'm, I'm really interested in kind of the behind the scenes too. So we'll talk about BombBomb, sure. Bomb, the actual tool and how it can help people. But I'd love to talk about the entrepreneurial journey a little bit because everybody starts with an idea yeah. and a lot of ideas go nowhere. So how did your idea come about in the first place? And then how have you kind of developed it to the place now where uh, it's really used by people all over the world? Yeah, man, it, it was early. It was 2006. And I, and I think the best ideas start with a problem, right? You got to be solving a problem for someone that I think that's the entrepreneur's dilemma. You see problems and you try and solve them, right? And, and that was us, Connor and I, as my co-founder, my best friend, you know, we, we were always entrepreneurial, uh, doing lots of different types of businesses, but we found, uh, we were, we were in the email marketing in those early two thousands. Um, uh, we were doing, you know, email campaigns, building websites, buying URLs back then. That was a big deal, but we realized I was in sales and marketing. So is he, that we couldn't replicate ourselves, right? Like we knew that if we could be face to face with more people more often that we could get more deals done. But, you know, how do you replicate yourself? How, how can you get this message out quicker, your pitch or whatever you're trying to do? So we thought, man, it'd be cool to do video emails would be interesting to do that, right? So we went looking for a product that did that and, and, there, and there wasn't one. Now, this was about <clears throat> 2005. So, you know, there, there was no camera in the iPhone. Uh, the, uh, Google, you know, had not bought YouTube yet and it was privately held at the time. So this video thing, we were so early to it, but we cobbled <laughs> this stuff together. Connor put a server in his closet and we hosted the first bomb bomb videos there. <laughs> and we knew that we wanted it to be this one-to-one -one dynamic, this personal human connection, like, Hey Jay, what's up? But then, you know, it was, you know, constant contact was new. MailChimp was new. So we started sending mass video emails and then we evolved into this one-to-one -one really, uh, what we call this human centered communication vehicle that we, that we know today is bomb bomb. So that, that's kind of the story, you know, we were super early. We saw the problem, we developed it, kind of quit his job. I kept mine for a few more years, quit mine in 2011. And uh, we started with about five people making, uh, making videos for folks. We, we would hand crank them back in the day. We'd actually come and shoot the videos for you. Cause they're just, you know, the flip cam was the biggest thing going at that point. I mean, like in 2007, the flip cam was a big deal. I always tell Connor, man, we were too early. God, we were too early. If we're still too early, I think that video now is uh, more commonplace, but it's still, when that camera turns on, people get a little freaked out. And so we spend more time helping them think through that and get over that than we do anything else, I think. You know, it's so interesting. Um, a couple things that you said there that I think are really important and I want to double down on. Number one, you said you were trying to solve a problem. Yeah. And I think that is such a big deal. That's a lot a of deal. times I work with business owners who can't clearly articulate the, the problem that they want to solve. It seems so simple, but a lot of times they have these big convoluted answers to what the problem is. And if you can really clarify what that issue is, like in your case, we needed to be face to face with more people, but we couldn't do that. So how do we multiply ourselves and create more opportunity for that? Um, it's amazing. It, it also made me think about when you talk about like recording videos for people. Um, I remember a story about the guys who started Airbnb and how they would literally fly around and take pictures of people's condos in the yeah. early years <laughs> or, or part to rent them out because nobody knew how to take good photos. And they knew if we can take good photos. And it, photos it, were everything it, to, to right. that. Renting, right? Yeah. Right. And so it's so crazy to think about that now um, because video is a lot easier to access. But to your point, a lot of people are still scared of it. So yeah. what are some things that you tell people when they first flip on that webcam and they're trying to send a bomb bomb? Like, how do you help encourage them to get better and more comfortable at that? Yeah, we, we focus on them getting an aha moment. And that's where the value occurs, right? And, I, and we really feel that that occurs when another human being reciprocates the message back or is, is, is blown away by what they receive. It's, so what we focus on is telling people, like, send gratitude. Be, send gratitude messages. They're, frankly, easier to think about. 
you know, uh, many people still have grown up with this idea of the 10 o'clock news being how we need to do video that it needs to be perfect and lit right and everything else. And so um, we try and get them over that by, by saying, send a gratitude video to Jay, send a gratitude video to someone who maybe works with you, or maybe it's someone in your personal life, just, just send them a video saying, thank you. I appreciate you. We kind of script that for them and let them fill in the blanks about the why there. But then almost inevitably they get something back from that person that it, it overwhelmed them, blows them away. Humans don't get that much anyway, especially now in this crazy situation we all find ourselves in. Uh, human humans have intrinsic value, and in, in when humans connect with each other like this with video, I love being able to see you and connect with you this way, Jay, because human beings connect more um, non-verbally than they do verbally. So when they send that first gratitude message, one, you're making that person's day, but frankly, you're about to make your day too. You just don't know it. And I think that's a beautiful thing that we try and create right off the bat. Because if, if I can get you to show gratitude, I'll get a, this reciprocal effect that makes you have a great experience with our product, right? Yeah, I love that idea. And you actually did this. You don't just tell, tell people to do things. You actually did it yourself. When you booked this call, you actually sent me one and said, hey, Jay, I'm excited about being on the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, let me know if you need anything from me ahead of time. Yeah. Looking forward to it. So that's a perfect example of that because that is a gratitude video. It's you kind of walk in the walk, if you will. Yeah, and we, we think that's important too, by the way, at Bomba. We think that's important. We're proud of, I think I've sent something north of 10,000 personal videos. Wow. We got, we got some folks at BombBomb, you know, in sales and stuff that have sent north of 20,000 personal videos. We're proud of that. At BombBomb, we've sent over 600,000 as a company together, personal one-to-one -one videos. And I, I just think the world lacks this, this, this feeling of being personal again. We're, mm -hmm. we're inundated with what I call it digital pollution, man. It's like when I get off this call with you and I'll go to my inbox, what's going to be there waiting for me is like, endless automated email uh, messaging and LinkedIn or whatever it might be. I want to bring humans back to the center of our communication. I just think it's critical. I think we could, we could go to our 10 years like this. I think a lot of us would be burnt out from it. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Like I've been in marketing my whole life and I'm, and I've done sales my whole life because you have to, if you're going to run a business successfully, but I don't, I don't do this enough. I mean, I, I hardly do it at all to be honest. Yeah. Almost the only time, if I'm really thinking about it, almost the only time that I personally really do a lot of videos like this, and I'm very comfortable on camera. That's the interesting yeah, part yeah. That's when I think about it, is I'll send videos to like show somebody something if I want to explain it, or if I'm doing like yeah. a web, I might do a website review for somebody and kind of talk through some ideas. And it's easy to do like a screen share and show them, but I don't do it for for what you're talking about and it would be so easy to do and, and that's the beauty of the product that you've created is it does make it easy well it has to be fast it has to be simple but you know we're in a habit we've been in a habit for a long time we realized that early on that we were trying to break this text email habit right the text habit um texting has become prevalent in our culture that's fine but you know as well as i do people do things in those environments they, they would never do if they were face to face with another person they frankly probably would not say it out of their mouths, right? But right. somehow we get in our internal selves and we text it, we type it, we get super passive aggressive on social media about something we care about. I just, I just wish people were more connected now. I feel we're more disconnected with these things. And that's why you know our mission is to rehumanize the planet. Mm. And that's a big heritageous goal, but it's because we truly believe this is a problem that we're facing in our culture it's in our businesses, it's in our personal lives, this removal of humans, we got to get back to face to face somehow. Yeah, I think that's really big. And another thing too, just to point out people that are listening who may have not really kind of glanced past what you just said, that idea of the big, hairy, audacious goal right. comes from Jim Collins. If you haven't heard that before, you should go look up that idea. And, and, and for everybody that's listening or watching, it's one of those things where it's so big that you just can't even wrap your arms around it. Um, but the idea of it's really exciting. And you think, man, what would that look like? What would the world look like if this happened? And like just me thinking about your BHAG, which is not mine, like makes me excited. And that, that's a that's a big idea for people to kind of take away from is what is your big, hairy, audacious goal? What does that look like for your company if you're watching or listening? And I think it's so important for companies too, because you know, for me, that's why people work at BombBomb. Bomb. You, you can answer the phones at a different company. You could sell for a different company. You could be in product you know, or in, in, in design and all these different positions we had, you can do that in a lot of places you're talented, but why do you do it here? 
Yeah. Why do you want to be at Mamba? I think that BHAG for anybody's business really should galvanize the why I, I work here. I mean, and we're always recruiting top talent. You're trying to retain top talent. This is one of the key ways to do that, I think, is to give them their why of why they're working with you, that they tie into this idea. It's such a big deal. And that BHAG, I think, ties it all together. Now, you've, you know, you've built this company from zero dollars, which is where all companies start to, you know, tens of millions of dollars in recurring revenue. And uh, number one, I always tell everybody they need to find a way to develop recurring revenue in their business, regardless of what they do, because it's just so good to not have to start every month from zero. Um, but as you kind of develop this business over time, did you have prior business experience? Had you been an entrepreneur before? Did you work in the corporate environment? What was your past like before yeah, all of that's this? That's a great question. I always, you know, I, I didn't know as an entrepreneur when I was younger, but I was, I was like, I was kind of one of those bad kids. I, I was in high school, I'm printing homework coupons. I had this teacher <laughs> that, that had these homework coupons. I'm sorry, Mrs. Hauser, you know I did this, but um, I, I would mass produce them and then sell them. So, so there was these tendencies, but I was, no one ever sat me down and said, hey, that's wrong. Like you're an entrepreneur, that's a good thing, but what you're doing is bad. But I, I always had these things and I, you know, started a painting business in college kind of thing. And um, so that was always there. But um, yeah, I, I know I, I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. What was the other part of that question? Well, this what what was what was your work life like before oh, this? Yeah. You said you kept your job for a while and then you That's ended right. up quitting. So what, what did that look like? So, you know, we own this, <clears throat> Connor and I own this pretty big service company that we did house painting, apartment turns, all kinds of different stuff. But we had invented this uh, online calculator to estimate how much it would cost to get your house painted and stuff. So we were always that marketing engine side, ended up uh, selling that business and then getting into, uh, I got into a marketing business. That led into me working for a television station for about seven years. Hmm. And so I learned more about media there. I was the online guy. I was hired to be, you know, build their first website, get email marketing going for them. I ran the salespeople and the content people there. So that was a great experience for me. I was allowed to be an entrepreneur within a business, which I think was critical. It was the only job job I've ever had in my life. So um, that, that was really good. And fundamentally, that's the job I had as I was transitioning to Bob Bomb. And, and it helped us think about, and I was really into Seth Godin at that time, still am, big fan of Seth Godin. Just reading about, you know, your, how one person could have a thousand true fans or followers. Mm -hmm. And I had this idea of media was that then like the, the nightly news was the king right and like that was it. it was the only way that you could do that so this idea that i could broadcast myself through video and these other mediums i saw that as something that was going to come in the future we're literally doing that right now you have your own audience you don't need to go you know buy a tv station and broadcast that so i saw that as fundamentally coming to happen in the time that we were there and that that's what led to bomb bomb i think even that seeing that and then getting with Connor and saying, we should do this and going after it. Yeah, that whole idea is so interesting that um, I actually heard Gary Vaynerchuk talking about this a while back, that literally every company and every entrepreneur should see themselves as a media company. And Absolutely. I think that idea is really powerful because, you know, when I started this podcast, the very first episode, I didn't have an audience yet. And I have my own audience, like with social and I'd written a book and things like that. But, you know, the podcast itself didn't. And now it has a lot of people who listen to it on a regular basis. And, and I, like you said, I've, I've literally created this platform that I now have access to where if you had told me a couple of years ago that I would get to talk to hundreds or even thousands of people a week in person, I'd be like, great. So where do I go? Sign me up. And now I can do that from the comfort of my studio at my office and, and I can have a lot bigger impact too. And that's, what's so exciting about me. And, and it's kind of the idea of like why you started bomb bomb in the first place is it's, it allows you to create a bigger impact uh, than you, than you otherwise would have before. Yeah. Replicating yourself. It's this, this expansion of yourself that you can be in more places more often with the people you want to communicate with. That was the idea. And that it was, we kind of went into mass email sending too, right? Which was crazy to think about. And we still do that, but that, that broadcast medium, but broadcast the video. Um, there's, there's companies I think that do that better than we do it, but we own that idea of this personal one-to-one -one video, right? That, that this communication style, that's what we want to do 
then, but the demand wasn't there. I think right. another thing we learned is that you kind of, then we had to give them what they wanted because no one wanted personal one-to-one -one video at the time, mm -hmm. right? So then we, we did that and then having to pivot, that was a hard thing for us. And then pivoting when it was right and choosing that time because we could have just kept going as that business you know, but we pivoted into this, uh, into the one-to-one -one when we thought we could, when the market kind of showed up for us there. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause I, I remember back in the day when you wanted to record and send the video to somebody online, like you had to record it. You usually had to like import the video into your computer. Right. Then you had to upload it somewhere. And that probably had to be like converted into some kind of format that they could actually watch it in. I mean, this was like a multi-step real pain in the butt oh, yeah. kind we of used process. To have a, a checklist. It was like 50 things like, Oh, you want to do what the software does, you know, yeah. long, or you could just do this, right? It was a very, very strong comparison. Now these things are getting easier and we find our problem shifting too, right? Mm. I think our problem where it was being face-to-face -face more often while we do that, now it's this digital pollution problem that I talked about that uh, it's just being inundated. I think everyone's now escalating it. Like I have to send more emails to get your attention for my business then everybody's doing that. So how do we break through and how do we connect and how do we build connection? I think that's the problem that we're trying to solve now. I think that's interesting too, right? That that was a learning for me that maybe my problem will change. Mm. The, the, the original one still exists, but this new one is showing up for us now. And I think it, and it's growing. And I think that's the one that we're going to tackle in the, in the future. So I'm curious how you've handled um, change in the marketplace as things have grown. Cause, because originally you had the problem the internal business problem of just adoption rate, right? People being willing yeah. to even understand the problem. I always say there's, there's always three kinds of prospects. There's people who don't know that they have a problem. There's people who know they have a problem, but they're not sufficiently disturbed about it to do anything. Right. And there's people who know they have a problem and they're sufficiently disturbed about it to figure out how they're going to solve it. Yeah. And, and so early on, you had that problem, people really not realizing the problem that they had. And then maybe they did. And, and, but now there are other tools in the marketplace that do similar things, right? So you have sure. more competition, which is normal. Yep. Like yeah. you're going to be a, you're going to be early in the marketplace. There's great value in that. And then along the way, people are going to go, that's a good idea. I think I could do something similar, change the name of it and tweak it a little bit and call it my own. So that has happened um, across just about any kind of software platform you could imagine. How have y'all dealt with that in, in, in your growth as a company, just competition coming into the market space? I think we see ourselves as an education company not as a technology company. I think some of the things I've been even offering here and maybe made you even think, wow, I didn't think about it that way. Um, that's where we lean into that. The idea that we, we're the company that sends over 600,000 of these personal one-on-one -on -one videos. There's nuance to that. There's um, different things that need to be brought to bear there that I think we can offer. And so while we, we're the competitive, there's other uh, products that may do what we do. Um, we offer this, guidance to success. That's what we call it. It's a core competency of ours, guidance to success. We want to be the guide. I know you're um, uh, a big uh, story brand guy. So that yeah. I mean, we are too. And that, that really resonated with us. That's where that core competency came from. Like, how will we guide you through this? Because at the end of the day, you still have resonance about turning on the video camera. That is the problem. And then getting that response. It's really about responses and, and, and about reactions to the video the recipient side of that is so much more important than just sending a video. Because if you mm -hmm. don't get that, if you don't get the response, you don't get the reaction you're looking for, it really, you, you won't create the habit that you need to create to have this be a long-term thing. So we provide this guidance, this education, we've been doing it for a very long time to help people understand the value there and how to extract the value. And maybe some things they need to stop doing and allow these things to happen. So. You know, I think that's the problem, right? That's, we kind of been working towards this idea of more of human-centered communication, not just about video, but about how humans should be communicating again, moving forward and mm -hmm. try and change that paradigm. I think that's the problem we're trying to solve now, not just how to send a video through tech. Because, you know, look, all the competitors in the world, we can all go into a tech arms race as far as features. Sure. You know, it's just money and time. And I can build any feature that I have or you have. It doesn't matter. What makes companies different is how they guide people through that, I think. And especially now, we think we have a handle on video, but there's far more people in the third uh, item that you proposed that 
that they get it. There's far, I mean, that's where the people are. It's like maybe 20%. This market isn't growing at, you know, a thousand percent a year for us. So we're focused on that education piece. I love that idea because that, that's the kind mm -hmm. of thing that it also positions you exactly as you said, which is the guide. And I do love story brands. So as, you, as soon as you started the conversation, started talking about the problem earlier. I was like, I love this guy. This, <laughs> right. We're going to get along just fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, Donald Miller podcast, guys. If you're not listening to that, you yeah. need to listen to that. Yeah. Yeah. And they're actually about to change the name of that podcast. Uh, uh, soon it's going to be interesting. Uh, they're focusing on a larger business uh, focus, which is exciting. But we'll get into all that. Um, <laughs> What I love too, uh, you know, I, while you were talking, I glanced over at your website because you said you were in a story brand. And um, what's so striking to me when I first pull up your website is this, this, the sheer simplicity of it. It's so dialed in and so focused, especially software products. People tend to like just have stuff all over the place and you just yeah. really clear, clear video, clear message, one single call to action that I want you to take. How has that morphed over time for you as, as you've learned to talk about yourselves, but really talk about inviting a customer into a journey? How, how has that changed for you over the years? It's giving me chills. It's, I mean, it's changed. Let me tell you, it changes. Con it's, I think that's the thing too. It's, it's, it's evolving. It's iterative, right? Like that website, for instance, we just redid it. Thank you very much. I'm going to give all the credit to Steve Passanelli, our CMO. He's a great guy. Um, he, he is really behind that and, and uh, a few others on his team, but that that you know has changed I, I think about the first website we created and it was very <clears throat> feature driven i think most are right it's most of the time we're just throwing features out what we want to do in that website is show you people mm. I, I mean i'm just going to keep saying it i think people need more time with people and i think we need to care about people and i want you to just see people because that is what we want you to do I want you to build connections with people. And I want that to be reciprocated and that there's value there. And that's all relations or all businesses built upon relationships, mm -hmm. right? We got to get back. That's our number one core value at Bomb Bomb is relationships. We got to get back to that. And so mm -hmm. that I wanted you to feel like with this business, you're going to, I'm going to help you build relationships. So I think that website really does that right in the beginning with the spaces you see are people that work at Bomb Bomb. They, um, they've been a part of our lives and we care about them and we wanted to showcase them. I would have such a hard time convincing so many clients to do a website like yours. And yet I think it's exactly what you need um, <laughs> because most people want it to just be all this glitz and glamour and all this stuff. And um, it's just so dialed in. I love it. One thing that's interesting to me that stands out is uh, as I scroll down, and look at the different video options that you have on there. Uh, one of the things that you guys do a lot in your actual video is the thumbnail or the kind of the screen that shows up does two things for people. It kind of shows a little animated piece of what's yeah. in the video. And it also says how long it is. So it'll play, it'll say like play 45 seconds. So just let's get a little tactical here for a minute for sure. people that are interested in doing these kind of videos. Uh, what is an ideal length? What have y'all found that people go, you know what, I'm willing to watch that versus ah, it seems kind of long. I don't want to deal with that. Yeah. Under a minute, ideally, really. And I always answer this question with, as long as it needs to be, yeah, right? But it depends on the context of your relationship with the person too. Ideally though, the answer to the question that everybody wants, it's under a minute. And if it goes more than two minutes for us, that disappears. So you don't know how long it is. So we're always thinking about the recipient experience and we want that video to be played. So we're trying to help you there. We actually tested that screen against millions mm. of, of different arrangements of that. And we got to that one testing a 40% better with that type of play button, the timestamp, the muted, there's a lot of stuff, the gift, all lead to a play more than other arrangements that we have there. But um, at the end of the day, I think the message should be concise. This is a part of what we teach, like have a plan. Now, in the beginning, we say have gratitude, be yourself, go yeah. for it, and send. But then as you, as you uh, mature in this, look, have your points. Tell them there's three things you're gonna tell them in this video it's a longer communication. Like I send a video every Friday to everybody on my team. Hmm. And I just post it in Slack. It's my Friday update. Now, you know, we have 150 some people. We're all still in our basement, right? Um, still here working from home. So now how do I stay in front of those people in this age? I have to communicate with them. They have to see my face. So I send videos to the entire business and I tell them, okay, guys, three things here on this Friday update. 
I'm going to give an update on the business. We're going to talk about how we're going to do a Christmas party and the whatever. I'm yeah. going through the things I need them to understand and want them to know about, but I'm teeing that up so that I get the engagement. So that, those are the things we help you walk through. I think that screen capture too is another good thing. You described this walking through a website. I would tee that up with, hey, there's a few things I really need you to understand right at the top of this video. You know, engage that just like when you're doing public speaking and that everybody's really great at that. So how do we help them mature, um, get better, evolve there? I mean, that's where we're going to take this, right? Yeah, that's really helpful. I, it's interesting that you take the time off when it's over two minutes. I think that's a smart move. The other, second thing is, um, I think it's interesting that you use it for internal communication. I mean, gosh, that's huge right now. And especially in a, in a situation where it makes it easy. It's yeah. easy to hit a button, shoot a video. It gives you a link. You can drop it in Slack or send it out in a text message or wherever you want to send it. Send it in an email and it has that data in there. Um, the other thing I see a lot in your one thing I'm going to circle back to as well, I want to circle back to, you said you got almost 150 team members now. Well, at one point you had a handful, it was you and one other guy, you know, let's talk about that transition. But before sure. I do that, I'm going to stay on this tactical topic, which is um, in a lot of your videos, I see people with little whiteboards and I'll yeah. say like, thanks, or I'll have somebody's name on it. Talk a little bit about the value of that, what, how y'all kind of use that. And because I'm seeing that in quite a few of your videos, it seems kind of like a, a strategy. So educate me a little bit on, on the value of that. I think that's really important to look <clears throat> when you're reaching out to somebody that you might not have a very strong relationship with. In, 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 if you're in a sales role and you're doing some prospecting, that tie in there is a little bit, it helps that person know that this is not an automated video. This is for Jay. Yeah. That's the idea there because we are so programmed to automation now that even if I show you a video, you don't really think it's real. Yeah. You get emails from people you know and you don't really think it's from them, right? So yep. that is a way to break through that again. Again, another training that we, we kind of prescribe to there is that, hey, Jay, um, I love planes too, or something you like and tie that into someone. If you know about them, you know, I looked at your bio, try to write down, okay, lives in Florida, family guy, like see a plane back there, all cool, right? So tie that in a little bit. Right. Um, use the whiteboard to, to build a relationship. If you were to meet someone at a, you know, a cocktail party, how would you approach that? Hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you. Oh, I, was, I was hoping I'd get to meet you. Um, I, I see you live in St. Augustine. That's a beautiful area. It's snowing in Colorado. Do that yeah. in your communication. So that's just the beginning of trying to break through of this, again, digital pollution that just is everywhere and what we're trying to break through. But I really want people to hear this and, re and really hear exactly what you're saying, because it's so, so important, not just with videos and emails, but really with everything, especially social media. You know, I would say the biggest mistake a lot of people make on social media is they just run around going, buy from me, buy from me, buy from me, buy from me. Oh, yeah. And and if I was at an in-person networking event, I would never do that. Never. And if I did, nobody would ever talk to me. They like, would ignore you. Right. And there are a few people. We all know a few guys like that. Yeah. And everybody avoids them really like the plate. Through, right? <laughs> That's right. They wouldn't it's, care. And so what you're talking about here, really, it really has an impact on, on a much larger scale than even just video that we're talking about. It's, it's in every avenue of communication, especially in this digital world that we find ourselves in. I feel like we've kind of gotten catapulted forward even farther than we were based on just the realities of 2020. And um, those things don't all have to be bad. We, we can no. find the good in it. We can find the humanity in the midst of all the chaos. And, and that's a lot of kind of what you're talking about is, is how do we, how do we rekindle that humanity? I just, I'm so, I'm just tired of it. It seems to be cheapened now. Yeah. It's just being cheapened. And so I, I just want to, I want to give a tip because I've been doing this since COVID really I've upped it. I think it's really helpful. I, I send gratitude videos to my team. I, I can't go say, hey, good job on that deal or, hey, really thanks for coming through for us on getting that that um, product out when you when you said you would. You know, so I have to send these personal videos thanking them or new team members. We're hiring people right now that I've never met first time ever. If you got hired at BombBomb, I, I like to go and meet you and shake your hand and, and I can't do that. So how do I do that? I send them Hey, what's up? My name's Darren. I'm glad you're here. We need you here. You're important to us. I'm so glad that you're with Bomb Bomb. That is how you retain people, we think, you know. So I just give that internal communication is probably then for me, I, I probably do nine, ten of them a day. Yeah, uh, it's so good. And, and really that that idea of internal communication is really resonating with me a lot. And I'm thinking, man, why am I not doing that more? 
Um, it's so easy, so quick, especially the gratitude stuff. And it's so much better than just shooting a, a Slack message or a text message of any kind. A video is always better. That's of course better than nothing. But at right. the end of the day, if, if, you know, I want them to see me and, yeah. and think, man, I love working here. <laughs> yeah. That's that's what I'm that's what I'm going for. I love that. Well, let's transition a little bit and talk about team building because this is a hard one. A lot of people, I mean, shoot, I've I've been stuck on it plenty of times, and we're not nearly as big of a company as y'all are. Um, is that building a team is hard work. And, and figuring out a lot of those dynamics, especially if you've never done it before, uh, can be really overwhelming. So you've gone from, you know, you and another guy, you plus a handful of people uh, to now, you know, well over 100 people on the team. Along the way, there's a lot of different transitions in that process. So what have you learned that would be helpful to people in those early stages of business that are, you know, they, they've not been in business for less than five years. Maybe, maybe it's them plus a couple other people. They're trying to figure out how to scale that team. What kind of advice and counsel would you give them today? Yeah, I think the team is everything. I don't, I am not here without them. It is so critical. I'll just say that. It's like, I think next to knowing what problem you solve, your team is probably the most second most important thing. Um, to go to war with, right? It's a struggle, like it's battle, it's hard. So you want to do that with people who are in it with you. And I think we we uh, hire slow <laughs> and, and try and figure that out. We adopted what's called the WHO process. It's a very programmatic approach to um, not hiring with your gut, but hiring um, really thoughtfully. I'm also a very, very big fan of the Enneagram. Um, I you know that's another Donald Miller thing, I think with, but we use that it does, it's, and it's a personality assessment if you're not familiar with it, but it, any kind of personality assessment, I think is better than none. Yeah. Uh, understanding yourself is so important first and then understanding others. Because when you understand yourself, you understand others, you can have empathy mm -hmm. and empathy is such a big deal when you're running a team and, and, and seeing where other people are coming from and what why they might be thinking that I think that's critical. And so we've tried to adopt those things and I didn't get to either one of those things fast enough. So I, if you're listening to this and you're at five people like do that now, I wish I would have done that earlier, but that those things helping us, we, we did an exercise with the, our entire leadership team. We did um, the five dysfunctions of a team. Mm -hmm. uh, Patrick Lencioni, fantastic. That's another just fundamental, yep. like, if, if every leader on my team, you got to read this book, <laughs> got to read Story Brand, they're just like, these are uh, tenants of our um, company. And so we went through the five dysfunctions and we do that. We test on that every quarter, think through that, like, how is the trust level? How are we feeling right now? Is there trust? Because if there is not trust and someone's holding out and not bought in, like you can disagree, but at the end of the day, you got to be bought in. So I'm looking for leaders and I, I try to ferret that out. I will go to my leaders and say, hey, listen, like you don't have to agree, but you got to be bought in, right? Mm -hmm. Like we can talk about it. And I want to hear what you have to say. And I'm not sold on whatever. I think having that conversation, so many times we're building silos. I think my whole world exists to not have them. Like I look for silos that are starting to form and I go with a bulldozer and I try and mow them over. So that's what I would give you that some of these fundamental things I, I read a lot. I think leaders are readers. Mm -hmm. You're not a reader. You need to become one. You need to start thinking about that. I don't have a favorite book. I have many favorite books. I think are just important things along the way when you're building a business. It helped me. I, I didn't go to college, right? I didn't. I just read, 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 read. And I think that helped me formulate the path that I was on. So I hope that answers your question. I yeah. got a, lot, a long time about that. The team is very, very important. And um, and we're, I'm just been blessed to have a, have a great team. And I don't think we'd be where we are without the people who have come along the way. And I'm always very surprised by that. Like, it's just amazing that the people who come, there's always, there's been hard times too. It's like, that wasn't the right fit. And I would encourage you to fail fast. And, and, and it's hard, but just sometimes you got to part ways that, you know, it's this old adage that who got you there won't get you there. That That is like truth a hundred percent true and sometimes there's still places for those people in the business potentially sometimes there's not and making that decision those decisions have been the hardest things i've ever had to do gosh yeah. early on the startup it's like you're close but right you know everybody this point and then this point and then the next yeah 
you know, I ask myself, am I the guy to take this to the next one all the time, right? So you got to be always asking yourself that, asking that of your team, having real conversations with your team. I think it helps. Yeah, absolutely. I just love all those things. And, and even people, you know, when you talk about, you know, leaders or readers, um, I'm a very slow reader. I, I think I'm actually mildly dyslexic. I've never been officially diagnosed, but I just am a really, very slow reader. And so I didn't read business books for a long time. I just winged it. And what I learned, though, over time is I could find ways that I could gain this knowledge. So for me, it was audiobooks. Yeah. Instead of actually physically reading, I listen to an audiobook. And yeah. so if you're one of those people out there like me who d- reads very slowly, um, or gets distracted, very distracted, uh, get an audiobook. And so I've had to learn over time. I'll, I'll get the audiobook. I'll listen to it. If I love the book, I'll buy the physical copy. I do, I do the exact same thing. And then I'll re-listen to it audiobook. faster so, so I can take notes in the book. <laughs> exactly. And so, and so that's had a huge impact on me and people like Patrick Lencioni or Simon Sinek or Dave Ramsey or Don Miller. I mean, all these people, Michael Hyatt, um, have just been revolutionary for like my own personal growth. And right. I, I really love what you said there too, of like asking the question, like, am I the person that's going to take the company to the next, next level? Because companies are like limited by their leaders. The, 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 the leader is the lid for the company. That's it. And I, I might be capable of raising a, a teenager, but am I capable of raising a 20 something, right? Like, or maybe that needs to go on their own. I, I just think being brave enough to ask the question and ask of your leaders that's a big deal because you're, you're, you're creating an asset that takes care of people and it's more than, you right. Know. It's more yeah. than, you. yeah. And that's so important. Like the, the, this, the, the, that reminder, like as you, as people that are listening or watching are building a team, it is not all about you. Like I, 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 the biggest, some of the biggest mistakes I've ever made as it, as it comes to like ascending other leaders or putting people in positions of leadership based on title or role or whatever was not always preparing them for, the cost of leadership. And I always say, when you become a leader, you don't gain power. You lose, you lose rights. You don't gain rights. Right. You lose rights when you become mm-hmm. a leader. And, it, well, I and, think and that's, that's it. That's the type of leader I want to be. Right. Well, right. I think there's, I think it is your, you too. I think sure. I, I see like I'm in service to these people and, and I'm one of those, right. like, I never, I want to be the first one on the battlefield and the last one off. Like I, I, I aspire to these ideas. Because I think that's how I want them to feel like I got their back, that I'm going to do everything I can for them, and that we're in this together. This is our business. Because so, that's how you move a needle, I think. It's hard. It's, it's not easy. And sometimes we disagree and we get, it's like a family, you fight all the time. But right. at the end of the day, you find alignment, you find, because you, you trust each other, because that trust is the biggest tenant I can offer people. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody that hasn't read Five Dysfunctions, like that base base layer is trust. And uh, that book is just, everything Pat, Pat does is amazing. But um, I think you're an entrepreneur, so you read a book and you, again, that problem solving, you, and you start to think about how to apply those things to your business. And I think mm-hmm. that's an entrepreneurial tendency too. Is that when you, so that's what I encourage people to do is like when you're reading, it, it will come to you. These things will come to you about your business and how you can implement these ideas. And so you know, you, I, I, I push myself because sometimes I get off the habit, but even 20 minutes a day is all it takes. You can start blowing through books if you spend 20 minutes a day. Yeah, there's a, a newer book that I just started reading this morning, actually, uh, by Seth Godin. Gosh, now I can't remember the name, but it's called like The Launch or The Ship It or something like that. Um, but it's Sounds really like interesting. It's title. I can't remember <laughs> the title now, but it's I think I think it's new anyway. Um Anyway, I just love that too. I love that idea of always kind of seeking that next thing. And, and, and although I have had seasons where I've kind of burnt myself out a little bit, even with that, even though I love this stuff, like I, I literally eat it for breakfast. I, I just absolutely love it. But I've had seasons where I, I was feeling kind of exhausted. I had a friend go, when was the last time you read a fiction book? And I was like, never, I don't read fiction books. <laughs> I'll watch a movie or a TV show every now and then, but I'm not going to read a fiction book. And, um, but he finally convinced me to the first one I, ever, I got back into was ready player one, which was great. Cause oh, very okay. nostalgic as a yeah. child of the eighties. Um, but, but I found, found myself a little bit burnout because I was jumping so fast. I wasn't giving it time to marinate. And somebody told me one time, like one thing that you, you should do, which I have started doing a little bit more is going back and going, Hey, I read that book five years ago. Right. And it was yeah. so good. I got read a couple of things out of it. Maybe I should give it a rerun. I read history to change that up. I always, you know, I make myself, I, I get to listen to history books on the treadmill. 
Because I yeah. love history. It's one of my hobbies, yeah, yeah. right? So like I reward myself when I'm working out, I can listen to a <laughs> history book. Or that's my, when I'm on vacation, I'm reading a history book. I'm not so reading funny. History books, right? So we're like, like we're, we're so similar because I know I, I was literally great. on the treadmill a couple of days ago. And if you haven't read this book, you'll really love it. If you're a history buff, this is totally unrelated. People are listening or watching, but whatever. It's uh, it's called The Splendid and the Vile. It's about uh, Churchill and Hitler. Oh, and uh and all the content comes from their uh, secretaries. So, it, but it's written in the really good kind, of, almost almost like a narrative format. Um, um, I, I can't remember that. the author's name, but the Splendid and the Vile. If you like history, you're gonna love that book. And World it's War II super, is my genre. That, is, that book is it. so good. You're gonna love it. It's super interesting. Okay, so let me let me let me start to land this plane a little bit for people who realize we're way off track, but that's okay. Um, I'm a three on the enneagram, so that's what I do. Um, is uh, work-life balance. I always ask about this question because I have seen a lot of entrepreneurs burn themselves out uh, or burn their families out or burn their friends out or whatever. And I've had plenty of seasons of making plenty of those mistakes myself, no question about it. Number one, I don't really love the term work-life balance, but it means something different to everybody. So this is kind of a multi-part question. First part, what does work-life balance even mean to you? And how has it changed through different seasons of your life? For example, reading history books on a treadmill, that is part of that, right? So how has that changed different seasons of your life? Man, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked this question. I want you to keep asking it because people need to think about this. Um, at the end of the day, what, who are they going to remember you for? It's not going to be being on a plane, a hundred thousand miler and proud of your status and uh, getting the upgrades at Marriott hotels, you know, and I speak from experience there, right? Like, uh, before this pandemic, one of the gifts it's given me is I've not, I've been here. I take my kids to school. I was on a plane 100,000 miles a year. And, and uh, it's really made me reflect on why. And, and <clears throat> do I need to do that anymore? And, you know, I never missed anything. I haven't missed a birthday or anything. It's been important to me. My wife is a, a high school counselor. Uh, we I have three children. I'm twin girls are nine. And my son is 11. My number one job is to be her husband. My second job is to be their dad. And, the, and then Bomb Bomb is somewhere after that. I, I really believe that. And I, I've been fortunate, though, to have a co-founder. So um, we've split these roles of leading this business. I kind of run revenue, and he runs development and, and uh, tech. And so I know that's a fortunate place to be, right? If I had all of that, then the hours get crazy. They do now. but I think you got to hold the line. Um, what I don't like about working from home is I shut this computer and I go upstairs and I'm instantly there. I, I like a little bit of a 30 minute like yeah. decompress, right? To, to be dad again and to be a husband again. So, um, but at the end of the day, um, I think it's just super important. I, I work on making sure I unplug. I shut it off. I, I, I try not to, I put my phone in a certain place so I'm not checking emails. These are things I've learned. I just know that I want to be a good dad. Mm -hmm. I want them to remember a good dad, not a working dad. Not, who cares? They don't care. I own a business. No one cares about that. I had a buddy of mine just talked to him about the same thing. And it's like, no one cares if you become a two-star general, man. No one, yeah. especially them four kids. Like they yeah. need you. This is what it's about. I, I believe that people are called to their lives. And um, the calling isn't necessarily about the business. I think a lot of people want to attach it to that. Well, we got to fulfill that. And I think the number one thing we can do is be great partners who are significant others and, and great. If you have kids, man, that, that's it. You only get them for so long and, you, and it's a gift. And so I think it's super important. I don't do a great job with all the time, but I want to. I love <laughs> yeah, that. History books. I just needed to heal myself. I agree with you. I, it just, it becomes NASCAR, like going 200 miles an hour. Yeah. That's like right. All the books kind of fly by. And so breaking that up. And when I'm on vacation, I'm on vacation. Yeah. Like that's super tough. Not, not bringing work with me. Cause I, because let's face it, a lot of us, we say we're working for this, but we get a lot of importance from ourselves when we do these things. Right. It's like, it's healing from to ourselves to say yeah. how busy we are and that's just, I, I think that's a lie. And I think that we need to like um, talk about that more and not be sucked in. I think the culture sucked us into that. The things that are rewarding in our lives, the things our memories are gonna, that we're gonna have for the rest of our lives. I just don't think there'll be much about the business stuff. Yeah, so interesting. Um, 
I, I just this has been such an encouraging conversation for me um, because it just reminds me of what I what Matt what, what matters. You know, even yesterday, last night, I, I I'm a little overloaded right now. I got too many things. I've I've taken on probably too much than I should at the moment, but I'm good at that. And last, my wife and I lead a a young married disciple group uh, through our church that meets at my office, um, and we had that last night. But I had so much going on, and they're showing up as I'm trying to wrap up work, and I'm like, man, I, I'm just exhausted. I don't, I don't know if I have the mental capacity. For this. But once it was done, once once we kind of wrapped up for the evening, I thought, man, I'm so glad I did this. This was the right. most important thing I did all day. Those things and, are life giving. Right. So many times we give ourselves to things that take. Right. So what things are we doing that give? And yeah. to me, that's reading history on the book, on the, on the treadmill, or, or listening to it. And it's also, I know, going to soccer games, going to soccer practices, taking my kids to school, dropping them off, knowing the principal, knowing the teachers. I've been to going to the orthodontist. That's nuts. I haven't gone to the orthodontist <laughs> ever, right? <laughs> so um, I just think that, I, but I, I rest these moments knowing uh, the other night with decorating the Christmas tree. I'm like, man, snapshot in time. I got to sit here and love this because this will leave. This will yeah. not always be this way. So yeah, yeah my oldest, uh, my oldest just turned 16 on Monday and um, you know, I wrote him a letter uh, and gave it to him in the evening. And, you know, I, I just said it, I, I remember, I, I remember like it was yesterday bringing him home from the hospital going, yeah, I don't know what we're going to do with this thing. You know, <laughs> how do I, I'm not qualified for this. You <laughs> yeah, know? That's scary. That's and now he's scary. driving a car, you know, it's, right. and it's, and it's, and he's such a great kid and, and really by the grace of God, honestly, over anything else. But I always say very similar things to you, which is, you know, the best thing I can do for my children is to love their mother well. Um, and, and at the end of the day, I don't, I mess that up all the time because I love the work that I get to do. I love work. I, I could work all day, every day and be it's very satisfied. I haven't a had a being. job in 15 years. Like, I had somebody, I'm on a, I'm, I'm going to be on a podcast in a couple of weeks. And they, the question they asked me was like, what's my passion project? And I'm like, I don't know. Like everything I do is my, it is my business. I, I don't have like a side passion. This is my passion project. Yeah, I had a buddy say, well, all you do is work. I'm like, it, well, it, it, doesn't, it feels like a hobby. Right. Exactly. <laughs> And I, and I'm, I'm, I, I completely realize how fortunate we are to say that, right? Yeah. Like, and it's hard to jump off and, and pursue these things. If you're listening that like, it's hard. That is not easy to leave my easy job that paid me well to do this and pay, get paid less to yeah. build something, but I don't work. I don't feel like it. some days are harder than others, but at the end of the day, I love it. And don't be confused if you're listening or watching. Like I have had plenty of hard days yesterday actually was one of them. This isn't like a 10 years by gone. Like, no, you know, I, there's plenty of really hard days in the midst of it. But I had somebody, um, this remind me what you said a minute ago about kind of who who matters the most. I was on a podcast and they, the last question they asked I thought was really insightful. They said, uh, what do you want to be known for? And I said, well, I think that depends on who's doing the knowing. <laughs> That's like because great. I would like to know, be known for something different from my wife than I would from a client um, or a colleague or my children. I mean, there's maybe core principles, but at the end of the day, they were wanting like, I'm the marketing guru or I'm the business growth guy or I'm the whatever. And I'm like, eh, like, yeah, right. you know, and That'd so be I, kind of a fail. And we, could <laughs> we could probably go on all day, but I realize yeah. now that we're running out of time. So, um, Darren, two last things. Number one, where can people find you online? And number two, uh, what's some parting advice you'd give to people to build a business that lasts? Yeah, I think, um, it, like I'm on the, all the usual places, just I'm easy to find. I think Darren Dawson, I'm on Facebook, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter. Um, but the, the last thing, I, I, we, and we've already said this, I think, how do you build a business that lasts? Solve a problem. You have to have a problem. The problem has to be painful. What's the pain? Um, build your team. The team is critical. Then I think focus on the goal. What's the goal? The goal doesn't have to be exit, but you know, selling the business. It, it might be, but I like to have, I have medium goals. I have long term. I have a year, I have three, I have five. Those are personal for me. Uh, they're also for the business. And I encourage other people to do the same thing. And then reward yourself along the way. So when you achieve a goal, buy the car take the vacation, do the thing with the family, whatever that is for you, but reward yourself along the way because it's a long journey. Don't fall into this. It is false that we're all going to sell to Google for $10 billion. That is false. A lot of us are going to do this for a very long time. Uh, success does not happen overnight. It, it is a journey. 
And so reward, reward that along the way, take that time, breathe. And that's the goal part. Have the goal is, is the critical piece. Know where the business is going, but have that in a year, three, five, and then reward yourself when you make these things happen. I remember I drove a Toyota Camry, dude, for 15 years or something. And I, you know, we had a good year. I think it was like in 2013. My wife was like, go buy that car. And she knew that was my goal, right? Like the yeah. thing had 250,000 miles on it. Connor had a Honda Accord. Like people were, I was starting to be like, this is getting dangerous. Like, you know, like you need to not, drive. I was like, you need to not drive this car anymore. Like you, you get hit in this thing, you are dead, right? So we both bought cars that year. <laughs> not crazy, but it's just, that was a big deal for me. That was my goal that year personally. The goal for the business was a monetary goal but and we hit it you know and so that's why i allow myself to do that so that's that's the advice i give i love it so solve a problem build a team have a goal and reward yourself along the way that's some really good parting advice darren it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show i think everybody that listens gotten a lot of advice and uh wisdom and and, and hopefully some good stories along the way uh, yeah, it's a pleasure he, to meet he, you man I appreciate it. Uh, if you want to check out BombBomb, bomb, go to their website, bombbomb.com. They have a 14-day free trial on there. I know I need to start using it for some internal communication, if nothing else, and probably could use it for our sales as well. So, um, Darren, thanks again. Love having you on the show. Appreciate you, man. Seriously, have a great day. Hey, I hope this video has helped you with some tips and ideas to build a business that lasts. Make sure you subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss out on the next videos that we roll out. And more importantly, for some awesome free resources, head over to our website at buildingabusinessthatlasts.com. You can get a free copy of my book there where I tell you how I have built an agency that's grown year over year for the last 20 years in a row. So go grab that, buildingabusinessthatlasts.com, and make sure to subscribe to our channel. Thanks. We'll see you soon.